thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be giving this seminar today. Um, as I said, it's about um, getting software correct or right. Um, I do wanna say that um, as I talk about things today in this webinar, I'm gonna mention specific um, aspects of software. I may um, mention specific articles and I just wanna say that um, I'm not picking on any specific software. These are just examples I'm using. There are um, examples across, across the uh, entire ecosystem. These are just helping me explain what I'm talking about. Um, so to start, there's a lot of um, software out there written for scientific applications. And this is just a picture of the Exascale computing project. Um, but as we know, there's software that's written for um, biology. There's software that's written for many different kinds of applications, chemistry, physics, quantum, healthcare, across the board. So we're using software um, in medicine, we're using it for medical devices. So we're gonna see software um, being used in many, many different types of scientific applications. And sometimes it fails. So this is just an example of um, an error that occurred um, in NCBI BLAST. And you can see that this is just crashing and we see an error. And this is something that you've seen quite often if you're working with software. Um, now this is something that's very obvious and we know that the system isn't working correctly and it crashed. But sometimes we have more, we call subtle types of things go wrong. And these make things more challenging to figure out if they are incorrect or um, even to debug them. So this is um, a sequence of discussions, again, from NCBI Blast. This is, I'm not picking on them. It just happens to be an interesting um, series of articles. Um, and this is talking about um, something, a particular parameter to the system. So there was a parameter max target sequence. And when it was changed, um, some users started to notice they were getting back different results than they expected. So the users were assuming that this was a filter, and if they changed this to a lower number, such as 10, they would see the same results, but fewer of them. They would just see the top results. And this wasn't happening. So some people started to complain on a um, user board. And in fact, there was an article written about this because there had been some potential, um, there had been some retractions where people had misused this parameter um, because they misunderstood it. And there was actually um, a reply to this from BLAST. So as I said, this got quite a bit of um, discussion. And the reason I bring this up is it's really interesting because in the end, it turned out it was more than that. So yes, there was um, a misunderstanding. So this um, was actually working correctly and it wasn't meant to be a filter on the results. It was actually a filter on the algorithm itself. And the algorithm has multiple phases and it was a filter in the early phase. It was actually an optimization that was supposed to be work, that was actually working correctly according to um, the BLAST developers. But it turned out as part of that, they also found a bug which they fixed in laser versions. So this just sort of highlights how difficult it is sometimes to understand that our software is or is not working correctly. And that often these are complicated results that we get back and we may not, everything may not just be a clear pass or a fail. Um, and so I'll come back to some of these issues later. Now we see a lot of this in the general software community. So the Consortium for Information and Software Quality has a report every couple of years. Um, this is from their 2020 report and they quantified the cost of poor software quality in the United States at $2.8 trillion. Um, there's a very well-known study from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST. Um, this was from 2002, so it's a bit old, but at that time, um, they were quantifying that up to $59 billion per year was being lost for poor software quality. And this number is only increasing. Uh, now in the NIST report, they made it clear that this was just the cost, the um, monetary cost. It didn't include other things such as cost to potentially to lives or um, harm to, to humans, et cetera. Now in the scientific community, I haven't seen a study, if, if there's one I would love to know about it, that has done something similar, uh, but we know that scientific software is regular software. We know that there are issues um, with all software related to poor quality. And so I think the costs may be different. It may be rework, um, which essentially can be quantified of scientists or having to rewrite articles or rerun studies or, re, um, or use large computational systems and have to rerun on costly so, um, hardware. So I think the cost is there, we just don't have the ability to quantify it right now. 
but people have been looking at this. So they've been looking at things like debugging high performance computing applications. So this is looking at how we can actually find the faults once, once, we, once they're there. Um, and they've been talking about things such as um, problems with science when the software changes. And in this example, they're talking about a very common problem we see in scientific software. We're often using large computations that have numerical, um, uh, numerical values that we're manipulating. And of course, we're running these on computers. So we have hardware registers. These are all approximations. And depending which compilers, which solvers, we're using, we may see different results on different systems, we may see overflows, and so this has been a very challenging part for a lot of scientific computation. And this even flows into the nature community. So this is an article that appeared in Nature. It was kind of an interesting discussion, it's a short article. What happened was they were looking at leaked emails from a climate research um, uh, organization, and it turned out that they didn't find any manipulated data, but they were looking for manipulation of data. But what they did find is a discussion of developers talking about their poor programming, talking about problems that are occurring in their software, and they did a larger study to understand um, what the challenges were of scientific software. And one of the takeaways from this paper was that we need better software testing. So that leads me to kind of the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Now, this is not going to be um, very in-depth in any specific area of testing, but I would like to talk about a high level, talk a little bit about um, some of the types of software testing that there are, some of the challenges, uh, some ways we can help with those challenges, such as models, um, looking at things like coverage. And then I'm going to talk about some ways we can solve specific challenges, such as the problem of something we call the oracle or what is our correct answer. And we'll see that as we move on. And then I'm gonna end with a topic that I've spent a long time working in and I think is very important and applicable um, to scientific software, which is configurability. So before I do that, I just wanna tell you what software testing is. So there are different ways that we can look at how our software uh, is working and if it's correct. And there are static techniques. So you may have heard of things called linters or um, static analysis or model checking. And those work on the code without actually executing the program. So those are static approaches. They just look at the artifacts of the software. Testing needs an actual implementation of the system. So it's a dynamic technique. And what it does is it takes some input. And this input in the scientific world can be as simple as integer inputs or string inputs, but it may be large models. It may be a climate model. It may be a model of some biology. It could be um, gates in a quantum environment. So this can be any sort of inputs. It could be signals or, or pictures, but this is the models. Um, and then it has to actually run this on a software system. So we need an actual instantiation of the software that we're going to be testing. And then we get a result. So this is the core part of what happens in software testing. Now we're not done though, because once we get the result, we need to determine whether or not that result is correct. So we have this notion of what we call the Oracle and the Oracle is the correct answer. So this is basically asking once we have the result, does it match our expectation? So that's at a very simple level, what testing is. Now in testing, of course, we don't just run one test, but we run sets of test cases. We run what we call a test suite and being able to come up with sufficient test suites, come up with good, what we call coverage across these test suites. These are all some of the challenges that we face. Um, so when we're testing, there's lots of different things we can test. I just talked about the correct result. So I might be thinking about functional correctness of the software. But particularly in scientific environments, performance may be just as important. So we may have a fault that, lead, that gives us the correct answer, but takes a really, really long time to run, and this could be problematic. We could have faults that lead to security problems. So again, we may have the right answer, but we may have problems with the, um, with the privacy of our system. We may have problems with interoperability, or even the usability. These are all different things we can test. Um, 
And of course, we can think about testing for things like extensibility and modularity. My focus today will be examples around correctness, but some of the techniques we use can be used for any of these other kinds of systems. I also wanted to say that many uh, of you working in the scientific community probably are used to seeing something called unit tests. This is testing, um, building tests for the small modules you build as you're building up your software. Um, these are still very important. They fit really nicely into a continuous integration, a uh, CI-CD environment, um, but there's more. And today we're gonna talk a little bit more about the system level um, rather than just only at that unit level. So we're gonna think about sort of both, um, the but the unit tests are there and they're important. I'm just not gonna talk a lot about them. I, I do want to say that, you know, we're talking about dynamic techniques. And so Edgar Dice Crew many years ago um, made this, said this famous quote, and it's still being used today. Um, when we're testing, we actually can't prove anything about the software. So testing is dynamic, which means it can only sample the input space of our software. And so it can only show the presence of faults. It cannot actually determine their absence. If we want to be able to prove something, we have to scope the system, we have to put some bounds on it and use something like a theorem proving, um, but that can only happen for small programs for small types of constructs. The minute we have something like a loop, it makes it very hard to be able to reason about anything um, beyond some small bound of that loop. Um, so in testing, one of our big challenges is how do we sample this input space? How do we run the right test cases so that we build up confidence? So testing is really about building up confidence in the system, not about proving that it's correct or incorrect. And so we really tend to focus on finding ways to test our system to show more faults, to show more problems, because that helps us um, as those get reduced over time, as we build up better test suites, it helps us have confidence that our system is correct. So I want to talk about some of the challenges that we see. Um, testing is actually a really difficult um, task if you want to find failure. So there's always some faults in the system that are easy to find. But the ones that can sit in the system and hide for a long time and then appear at the worst um, possible time, those are the really challenging ones. Ones that can we can release our code and we come back later and somebody finds that. So why is it so challenging? So I'd like to use this model. This comes from the Amin and Offit book on software testing. And I really like this view of um, why software is so hard to test. And so they, they need to have four conditions in order for us to find a fault in a system. So the fault is just the problem in this case in the code that's incorrect. And the failure is the behavior or the incorrect um, output that we're seeing. So when we see the program crash or we see the wrong result, that's the failure. So first we have to reach the point in the code where that fault is. Once we do that, we have to be able to change the code or infect it in some way. So we need to create an incorrect state in that program, which is gonna be an error. We still have to then propagate that out of the program. And last, we have to have some Oracle to be able to reveal or detect that. And if any one of these pieces is missing, we won't find the fault in the system. A second challenge is that covering code during testing only tests the logic that's there. And so we have today automated testing approaches. We have things like fuzzers. We have um, tools that will generate test cases for us. But we also need to test from the system and make sure that our software meets the specifications. Um, so I'm going to show you an example, and I'll explain a little more in a minute, of both of those challenges. So just to, add, to go back to my original example from the blast, clearly um, that original code that failed, um, that would have been, we would have been able to find that if we could solve challenge one, because we would have moved to a point where the program crashed. For the second example, using that max target sequence, um, unless we knew what the expected behavior was of max target sequence, and we were actually testing for that, um, we actually may not have found it, whether or not it's in the code. Okay, so tests can miss faults. So let me show you a very simple example. This is a program. It's a Python program and it classifies a triangle. So it takes in three inputs, A, B, and C. 
And what it does is it just sorts the sides first in these three steps. And then it returns whether the program, uh, whether the triangle is invalid geometrically, whether it's an equilateral isosceles or scalene triangle. And there's a fault that we've put in this program. So in this case, this first um, if statement is just trying to, it's just basically um, doing a sort. So we're moving if A is greater than B, we're just gonna swap A and B and move um, A into the second position. And you can see here that A equals temp is incorrect. It should be A equals B, which matches the code in these other blocks. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run a test case. And this test case, um, three, four, five, should return scaling. But if you look at this, you see it fails if A is greater than B. So it never even reaches the fault. So in this case, there's no chance of finding it. This test case may find other faults, but it's not gonna be a good test case for this particular instance. Let's run a second test case. The second test case, 511, this is an invalid triangle geometrically. In this case, five is greater than one, so it reaches the fault. It also infects it because it changes it to be 551 instead of sorting it to be 151, which is what it should have done. And so this actually infects it. And in fact, now 551 is a valid isosceles triangle. So the result of this program when it's caught below will be isosceles. So this is a good test case It will find the fault. Let's look at a third test case. In this case, we have two one minus one. It's also invalid. It also reaches the fault here. So if A is greater than B, it reaches this. And now it changes it incorrectly to two two minus one. But in this case, because we have this minus one as a side, and um, what happens is when it reaches this statement here, it returns invalid. So here it reached the fault and infected it, but it didn't propagate out. So this particular test, while it will reach the fault, won't actually detect it for us. Um, now, if we think about this more, um, if I removed this whole block of code, that has um, return invalid, that's checking for this geometric relation here, then, and I run the same test cases, I would get a different result. And I could even cover all the code here and still not find problems in the code. So I also need to know what the specifications are for the triangle and test from that level. So just testing the code is not enough. And that's what I wanted to point out. Now that's a little bit of a simplistic example. So let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So you don't have to worry about what this is doing. This is just a biological, um, this is software. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to predict growth values in an organism under some media. And this is telling me I have some objective value. It's using underneath the covers. This is doing a linear, uh, an optimization. And it's telling me this is my objective value. And now I'm gonna run the same application. I wanna run the same application using a slightly different media. So the only thing I've changed here is this media. I get a different result. And so my question is, is either one of these correct? Are they both correct? And we don't know. And we'll come back to this later. But this is going to be one of our big challenges because we need to know the answer to understand if it works correctly or not. And um, as, I, uh, as we all know, we're moving into a world where this is currently, this is using a known optimization technique. There is probably some stochasticness here, but we're moving to an environment where we're now using machine learning to do even more of our science. And so now that question gets to be even harder. So I've talked a little bit about the types of testing and some challenges. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, assuming there are no questions, I'd like to do a little bit about some ways we can sort of help in the testing environment. So I'm gonna move on to some models. We have not received any questions yet, so please go okay. ahead. Okay, thank you. So in the software engineering and in general, when we build software, we always have abstractions of our system. So we think about having, building things such as class diagrams or building um, architectures of our software. And those are abstractions of the software. The same thing can happen in testing. If we model what we're testing and we have an abstraction, then it helps us do many things. Um, and models can be different things in testing. So it can be, for instance, a model of the specifications or a model of the interface or a model of the code. And all of those help us reason about the software when we're testing it. So what it helps us do is it says, how much have we tested? If 
we go back to trying to build up confidence in our testing, um, that is something we can do if we have a model. And if we want to do something called automated test generation, which there are many tools today that will do that for us, we need to have a model of what we're trying to test. So there are different kinds of models that we use in software. For instance, we might use graph models, um, tabular, relational. Um, Grammar-based models are used quite a bit. Um, so if you've heard of something called mutation testing or you've heard of um, fuzzing, both of those often use grammar models um, to, to model the inputs to our system or to model the code. Um, but they're also logic-based approaches. The model that we use the most um, in general software testing are graphs. And so I'm gonna look a little bit at what a graph model might look like. And we can use graph models for multiple places. So we can use these for program control flow. We can use them on the interface. And we can also use them, for instance, um, for state machines. And there are more places as well. These are just three examples. Once I have a graph, graphs are really nice because they give us a natural way to think about how I've covered my system, how much I've actually tested. So if I have a graph, now I can say, well, I want to have tests that cover all nodes in my graph or all edges or maybe all n length n paths in that graph. Or I wanted to say I'm going to do m random length paths. But all of these are quantifiable and all of these help us build up confidence in our software because the more we can understand how much of our system we've covered, the more confidence we have that it's correct. Here's a very simple example of using a graph for um, code coverage of, so this is actually just code coverage of the software. So here's a simple um, program. And it says if x is less than y, and basically this we have this entry node into our program, this is the graph, and now we have this decision x is less than y, or the false case, it's greater than or equal to y. We now have two nodes that represent, we call these basic blocks. So these are continuous statements within, within this block. So if x is less than y, this is the code we execute. If it's greater than um, we execute this code. And at the end of this very simple program, we just exit. Now, a control flow graph could be much more complicated. We can have loops. We can have more complicated branching structures. Uh, we can also use control flow graphs to annotate them with data and look at things such as data flow on our program. So these are really useful. And the good news is we have many tools that will help us. So for instance, we have tools such as um, for Java, such as Jococo. In Python, we have things called like coverage.py or in C, C++, GCOV exists. And there also are um, other variants of this for parallel computing, et cetera. So this is an example of coverage in Python. Um, and you can see here that we just have a list of which statements we've reached. So those are those statements um, that are those consecutive statements. We have branches. So this would tell us about on that control flow graph, which of those branches we actually executed. Um, and in this control flow graph, I'm just going to hop back for a second here. If I wanted to cover all the edges in this graph, I know I need at least two test cases here because I have to cover this x is less than y and x greater than or equal to y. So I know that if I want to cover all those edges, in this case, those nodes, I need extra tests. Mm -hmm. So if I come here, I can now see um, which things I've executed. And some of the tools, this is an example of using Jococo um, on a Java program, shows me green areas. So these are areas that have been completely covered by my tests. Here I've got something on line eight, which is yellow. And that says to me that um, at least that one of the branches of A greater than B has been covered at this point. Um, and in this case, it's actually the negative branch because you can see all the code below that from nine to 11 is red. So what I know is I need to add test cases that will actually get into this code here. I need to add the other case in my test case. So I can look at this coverage to help me improve my testing and cover more code. And so this is what we can get when we have something like a graph model. Now graphs can be on more than the code. So this is a simple GUI interface on the left. So it just has um, a simple menu with file, new, save and save all. And this is a graph of the flow. So you can see that file, I can keep clicking file. So I have a self loop, but I can go from file to new and then I have to go back to file and I can go from file to save all. So this shows me the structure and I can use this to generate test cases to execute this GUI. 
This is a similar example on the right in a web environment where I can actually build a graph of the flow of a website. Um, and while I have tools that will automate this, such as something like a Selenium will help me automate testing in this environment, I also can measure the coverage based on a graph that I can build as a model. So those are some of the examples of coverage, um, but we have other kinds of coverage. So as I said, we want to cover the specifications. I come back to my triangle example. I want to make sure I've thought about all of the possible ways that a triangle can be created or can be invalid. And I can then cover those system requirements. And that is a non-code based view. And I may also want to look at something, for instance, called interaction coverage. Um, we'll talk about this very briefly at the end when I talk about some configurability. So this is looking at combinations of ways we put things together. Um, so I've talked a little bit about um, models and coverage now. Um, I can again take questions or I will move on to uh, solving some of these bigger challenges. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happens when we don't know what the right answer is for the Oracle. So we have had a couple of questions come in, but I think they're, kind of bigger questions that we can maybe uh, defer to the end. Okay. Okay, well, I'll then move on. So as I said, I think one of the most challenging problems today in scientific software is what is the correct answer? So the reason I'm building a big scientific application and I'm putting this on high performance computing environment or using machine learning to answer to predict an answer is it's non-trivial to come up with that answer. And so often, we don't know what that answer is. And so we have to be able to then either just look at something um, which is crashes or we wanna get the right answer. So this is really a challenge. So there are oracles that I call trivial oracle. So in that very first example I showed you from BLAST, we saw the program crashed. We might see something called a core dump or a segmentation error. And if any of you have been programming, you've seen all of these, or we might have an overflow um, or the program may just hang. And all of these are obvious in the sense that the program stops working. And so we know that they're incorrect. But they work if we, if we don't have a known result, but it's what we call kind of the weakest oracle. So often we use something called fuzzing and we send lots of bad inputs, mutated inputs to our software. Again, we don't expect to know the result, but we know if there's something wrong because it crashes but it doesn't tell us if the software is doing what we expect. So to me, this is the weakest problem. And if I come back to our triangle program, you can see that we have something we call a very easy Oracle. So here, this program is never going to crash if I run it. Well, um, it depends where how these inputs are coming in, but assuming I give it um, data that is um, valid and I have something to make sure I'm only getting valid integers here, this won't crash, but it could give me the wrong result. And in a program like Triangle, um, it's easy to compute what the answer is. I can just go look up what the geometry of a triangle is. But let's look at some other systems. So this system on the left is a um, system that's taking DNA sequences and is assembling them into a bunch of contigs. And it's taking in some library. Um, I have no idea what the right answer is. And I think it would be very hard for anybody to manually compute that. Now, they can possibly, but it would be very hard. On the right, I have an example of um, a simulation from um, some UAV work that I'm doing. And I can look at this quickly and say, this is the path. Looks basically OK to me. But I don't know if it's at the correct height. I don't know um, if all along this path it was correct, if there wasn't some sort of strong vibration that occurred, or if the tilt angle was wrong. I would have to look at a lot of time series data to know, or did it get there fast enough? What was the time it took to run this? So these are all things that are much harder to compute, and I may not have the answer to know if it's actually correct. So things that make oracles hard is um, they could differ, and they could differ by very small epsilons. So there's this notion we have rounding in our computers, right? Because we have uh, fixed hardware again, um, and I may have um, solvers that, for instance, have different levels of rounding, and they may round at different points in the program. Um, my expected result, as I've shown you, may not be computable 
without the program. So I may actually need the program to compute it. I could have something like time series data, like I've shown you in that UAV environment, um, or I maybe can actually create the Oracle manually, um, but it's going to take me a very long time. So if I think about trying to understand if um, a dynamic programming algorithm such as BLAST is using is correct, I could probably try to iterate through and manually figure out what the answer is, but this is gonna take me a very, very long time. And the other challenge we have is often our programs in science are simulating things. And they often have stochasticness built in or they're time dependent or they have different ordering. So I work a lot um, with chemical reaction networks and in those environments, uh, we can't control the orderings. This is um, of how our different reactions are fired. Um, so these are built into simulators as being stochastic and that makes them non-deterministic. So often I have to think about running things multiple times or running them for a long period of time because I don't know where my computation will settle. So these are things that make them hard. Here's just some examples. Here's um, a note from one of the versions of Python that talks about the behavior of the round function. And here they're warning you that 2.675 to two places gives you 2.67, which to me is a truncate, not a round. Um, but they're telling us this is the documentation. So you need to be able to understand this to know how your program is going to work. Here's two examples of um, growths in an organism. And to me, these look like they're probably the same value. Um, this is out to many, many decimal places. It may even be beyond the capability of the solver. But in order for me to know that, I would need to understand how that solver is working, what its limits are. So I might have to decide, well, anything at four decimal places is going to be the same or maybe even less. So I'd have to decide what, what the same means in this case. And in this last case, we're looking at results from something like BLAST, where I'm querying a database. Um, I'm running a complex algorithm, and I have no idea what the number of hits are. So I would have to have all that information to be able to figure it out. The good news is we have some techniques, and we have some of the same challenges today in machine learning. Uh, we're seeing many, many um, applications that are using um, AI and machine learning, and so they also need to use techniques that don't have oracles. And so two of the most common techniques that I'll just talk about briefly are differential testing and metamorphic testing. So I'll start with differential testing. So what differential testing does is it takes the same test cases, the same inputs, same models, and it uses two different programs or multiple programs and checks to see that they have the same functionality. So here's an example. I might run tests using BLAST, and then I might run the same tests using HPC BLAST. And then I would check to see if they're the same. Of course, there's a challenge determining equivalency. So we saw that example in the previous um, slide. Are those numbers the same? Um, what scope is the application using? Um, for instance, are we using the same databases, the same representations? So often differential testing, while it's useful um, in scientific environments. I think it's very challenging often to get differential testing to work correctly. So I think a better place to focus is something we call metamorphic testing. So metamorphic testing is used um, when we don't have a known answer. And the idea is rather than take run a test and say, is it correct or not? We run sets of tests. And then we define relations between those sets of tests. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll start with something we all know how to do, which is subtract. So suppose I take subtraction. Now we don't need metamorphic for testing. Suppose my, um, I run a test A minus B equals C. So I say 10 minus five should equal five. We know that answer, um, but let's assume we don't know the answer. What I can do now is I can say, now let's make it A prime, which is greater than A. So maybe this is now 15 minus five or any number greater. And what I do know about test one and test two is I know that C prime um, is going to be greater than C. And so what I can do is look at the results of C and C prime, um, which would be in this case 10 and um, five and 10, and I can confirm that C prime is greater. So that's a metamorphic test. We also can do things like take a list, count the number of elements, 
then we can sort the list and recount it. Or we can look at a database and ask a question to say, um, give, I want to look at all of the values greater than X. And now I will look at all the values greater than or equal to X. And I know that the second one has to be at least the same number, if not more than the first query. So those are kinds of examples. Now, some of those are very simplistic. When we move into scientific community to really get good metamorphic testing, we wanna use domain knowledge. So suppose, for instance, we're looking at ocean temperature modeling. We might wanna compute the predicted temperature. Then we may wanna modify that in some way, our environment, so that we expect our temperature would increase. Now, this is going to require domain knowledge to do that. But now we can run the second, the second test case and confirm that the first one holds. So metamorphic testing is not as strong as an exact oracle. But if we have a good set of metamorphic relations, and that is part of the challenge, is coming up with those and covering our space of behaviors, we can often have a lot of confidence in our system. So I want to come back to this example I had earlier on, where I had two different, um, uh, where I ran this same program and I got this growth value. And here you can see now I'm showing you this media. So this media is a minimal media that's used a lot for E. coli. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but it's growing. And now if I run this same example again, you can see that I get a larger value. And in this case, my media is something called complete, which in this, um, this is coming from um, the Department of Energy um, K-based system, the predictive biology system. And in here, you can see they have something called complete media. This media is a special media that has um, sort of a, all possible compounds. And so actually, when I look at this now, um, even without having a lot of knowledge of the biology, I would expect that this value is going to be at least the same as this value. They should both grow. And likely, this one would grow more. But without being a biologist, I can't really say that um, the complete relation. So I might say that carbon D glucose growth is going to be less than or equal to the complete. And if I can bring in somebody with more biological knowledge, then we can make those relations stronger and test for that. So this is an example, again, of this metamorphic testing. So I've talked a little bit about one type of um, problem and talked about oracles. I want to end with something that we see a lot in scientific software, which I call configurability. So much of our software can be modified or changed, we call configurable. So these are things like Firefox and Eclipse. You've seen all these, the Linux kernel. Um, this is actually a surgical robot that um, can be configured for many different types of surgery, um, the power system, many different kinds of systems. And this is a, um, a print of the BLAST environment when I'm opening up the algorithm parameters. And you can see that here I have many different parameters I can change. And this is what I mean by configurability. Um, let's come back to something like Firefox. You can see I have my preferences. And inside of there, I have many different, um, I have different tabs I can control. As a matter of fact, Firefox has about 2,000 different um, parameters I can change and I can select as a user. Um, and I'm going to show you, there's a challenge with this, but I want to show you this is some work I did with um, some collaborators um, at Oak Ridge. And I think it's an interesting example. Again, I'm not targeting any specific software. I think this just shows a nice example of some of the challenges we see with configurability. So this is um, this program that's a, doing a DNA assembly, and it's taking DNA sequences and, and coming up with some number of continuous sequences. So this is the input to the system. It's old at this point, but this was what it looked like. And it takes in a read library of some organism. And then there are these uh, four different parameters that we can control. So we were actually doing this as real work. And we just ran this system. And we got some number under, we call this our default configuration because we didn't change anything. And we got some number of continuous sequences. At the time, though, um, what happened was we noticed that there was a message saying that they had changed one of our values to something else. So this was in the log. And so we thought we better look at this. And so we reran it just to be sure that we were getting the same result. So we reran this with um, Kmax being 119, which is what it changed it to, and expected to see the same number of sequences. But we didn't. We saw something different. So now we got curious. So now we said, OK, well, maybe we just need to put in all the default values. So we went and we looked at the documentation. 
and we put in the default values um, that were in the manual. It turned out that this wasn't 119, so we were really confused now. We ran it and we got the same number as the second run, but not the first run. Um, so we did a little more expectation and this was partially on our end. We were using a tutorial and we actually had a shorter, it turned out that we only had a sequence to start with of 99. So even this 119 seemed like it was possibly too long. So we said, let's just try to use the defaults, but change this Kmax to be the length of our sequence. So maybe that was the problem. We ran it again and we got a different value. Now this has long since been resolved and it was a combination of um, documentation, some edge cases. Uh, some of these changes were things that were supposed to happen because we didn't understand some of the algorithms, but there were actually some problems that were fixed. The point is that this is just changing the configuration. And this goes back to that same example we saw when people were changing a parameter of BLAST and getting a result that they didn't expect. So talent for testing is how do we handle this configurability? This is an example of having um, a media player. So we have encoding, format, cache, closed captioning. And if I want to be able to run a test case, so these are all my parameters, each one has some values, I need to select an instance, right? So my test case is going to be open video, play to completion. And now I'm gonna pick a media player that's using raw encoding, video format, high cache level, closed captioning, and no network access. And I run this and it passes. But what I've just done is now I'm gonna run the same exact test case, but I'm gonna switch from to my cache to be low now. And when I do that, my system crashes. And this is a very common thing that we see in configurability. And the problem is that often different parts of a system, such as the encoding, were developed independent of the cache or independent of the format or the closed captioning. And when somebody developed the raw, they may have assumed they would have a high cache level. And so they never thought of testing that combination. And so this kind of thing can happen. We see this a lot also in security. So you can see here are some examples. This is from the CERT database where they're talking about combinations of, um, of configuration options that don't work together. And they just warn you to remove or limit that plugin so that you can avoid that fault. Um, and it doesn't impact just performance. This is from part of our study where we were looking at configurability and some bioinformatics software. And here, just this is a growth value. And you can see that this uh, y-axis here is actually the time in seconds it, it took to control um, to give us the answer. And you can see a wide range of time or performance to get the same growth value. And even in a case where we had no growth, where the system just failed from, you know, it didn't grow at all, we saw a wide range of time it took to answer that question. So performance can also be impacted by configurability. Uh, this is a, a shot of um, a graph of configurations versus faults. So this is actually a picture of um, the VI editor, Vim. And we have 60 configurations on the y-axis. We have 14 faults. These were seeded faults in the system. And our bubbles here tell us how many test cases, we had about 900 test cases, we're able to detect the fault. So when we see big bubbles, many test cases could detect the fault. But then we see cases here where none of those test cases could detect the fault. So it's the same test suite, just a different configuration. So if I was in any of these 10 configurations, that fault would go out into the field, we wouldn't find it, and it would be later on when somebody moved into that configuration that we would find it. Uh, the challenge is our configuration spaces are exponential. So let's look at this. So suppose I look at this example, you can see that I have three times three times two, three times two times two. So I have 108 possible media players here. Um, if I expand this and I have 10 of these configurations and I have five options for each, I have about 9 million, over 9 million configurations. Suppose my test suite just takes four hours to run that's about 4,500 years of machine time. So even if I parallelize it, this is probably not realistic. And if I look at something like the GCC optimizer, so GCC, which is a compiler for um, the C, C++ environment, has about 1,000 different options you can change. The most complex part of it is in that optimizer, and there's almost 200 options in there. That's an order of a space conservatively of 10 to the 61. 
So we know that nobody's ever tested every possible configuration in GCC. The Linux kernel has more than 10,000 features. Last I heard, it has about 14,000. Again, we can't possibly test all of this. So what do we do? So we want to think about this idea of coverage, and we want to think about now we're looking at what we call interactions between tests. So this is this notion of interaction coverage. And so one thing we can do is we can sample our space so that we look at combinations. We call T-way combinations. And at least we look at things. So we saw before that when we had um, a cache level and uh, an encoding that were incompatible, that that caused a fall. And we know in software often these low order combinations are lead to the faults. Not always, but it's pretty often. So we can say we're gonna have T-way testing where T is defined as our strength. The most mm -hmm. common of which you may have seen something called pairwise testing. So let me talk about an example of pairwise. So this means T is equal to two. So here I have the same media um, example and I've got nine what I call different configurations, nine instances of this. And I can't sample all, remember there's 108, but for just nine, I can cover what I call all pairs. So if I look at, for instance, encoding of MPEG, you can see this sample has stream video and audio. So all of the formats are combined with MPEG. All of the caching, medium, low, and high, are also combined with MPEG. And I can do this for any two of these columns. So I can say any of the formats. So if I look at video and I look at caching, you can see video is with high, video is with medium, um, and video, video is with low. So I found all three of those. If I look at closed captioning and network, I'm gonna have yes, yes, no, 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 yes, and yes, no. So all of the pairwise combinations are contained somewhere in this sample. And so this is commonly used um, in these large configurable systems. It gives us a way to systematically test the system. And there are many tools out there. We have some tools, but um, uh, National Institutes of Standards has a tool called X that you can ask for. Um, Microsoft has a tool called PICT, mm -hmm. and there are other tools out there. I just wanted to point out a couple of them to give you an example of some of the tools you can use to help you with this. The last challenge in configurability is once we find that something fails, so if I go back to that two-way sample, it's often challenging to determine what it is that causes it. So often we can use things such as classification trees. Um, so we can use something like the J48 algorithm and then try to heuristically say, well, we think these combinations of, you know, when we put these combinations of parameters together, then it will be okay, otherwise we'll get an error. And we can look at different kinds of errors as well. So we can have different labels at the bottom. And so we've used classification a lot in these configurable environments. So with that, I'd like to kind of summarize what we've talked about today. So we've talked a lot about sort of um, an overview of testing, of types of testing, challenges, models, coverage. Um, we've looked a lot at this issue of oracles. So we've tried to see how do we um, understand if we have the right answer. Um, we've looked at some solutions such as differential and metamorphic testing, and I recommend that everybody um, takes a look at those. And then we've talked a little bit about the problem of configurability. So with that, I think I've got a little bit of time left for questions, so I, I'm happy to answer some. Right, we have had a number of questions come in, so I will start at the top of the list. Um, it would be interesting to hear what you have to say about the use of machine learning and how this impacts uh, system testing. ML seems to expand our search space a lot, is there hope? My issue is that some of the algorithms are sensitive to the input, for example, classification trees. And this is exactly where things like metamorphic testing come in. So this is one of the huge challenges. Um, so there's two pieces there that you're mentoring. So one is the sensitive to the inputs and the tuning of the algorithms. So with machine learning, we have a tuning, and that's essentially a configurability problem. And so how you tune those algorithms, and I know there are a lot of auto-tuning, but understanding the implications of running, class, running um, ML algorithms under different configurations, under different tunings, um, I would definitely try to, you know, I think we have to sample those spaces. And then I think we have to be a lot smarter about using, um, building up better kinds of metamorphic testing. And, you know, we've been looking at this a lot, and it's very challenging to build up domain-specific metamorphic testing and to come up with tests that make sense in a domain and to generalize it and to build frameworks um, 
to really build up those kind of tests. But I think that's what we're going to really have to focus on. Um, just covering code is not going to be enough anymore. That can tell us, you know, if the program's going to crash, but it's not going to tell us if the answer is correct. So you need somebody who you have to work with the scientists, somebody who has the domain knowledge to say, does this make sense? If I predict this example and now I make a change and I predict something else, does it change in the way that I expect that science to work? Um, now, sometimes it may be giving you a result that is surprising because in fact, the science is surprising. And so this is the hard part. Um, it could also be because your model is not correct or it could be the software is not correct. And so I think the debugging phase is also gonna be really challenging. Um, but I'm optimistic that we we have these techniques and I think we can use them, but I think it's going to get harder and harder. I, I totally agree with that. Great. And this, I think, leads a little bit into the next question. Are there any specific system testing techniques or tools for scientific software? Well, there's a lot of work. So there's a lot of work that's being done on this problem of numerical overflow um, and that is, um, and I haven't been working in that domain, but there's a lot of research in that area, ways to find numerical overflow chat problems, um, especially when you translate software from one technique to another. There are also frameworks for testing um, things like, um, like CUDA and other, and other GPU-based algorithms, sort of parallel algorithms. So they do have versions of code coverage, et cetera, in those environments. Uh, but it varies on, on, and there's also some model checking. So I know there's a tool, um, Civil, that's being used a lot on parallel programming for model checking, which is not testing, but is also but looking at the, um, the code level, the model of the program. So there are techniques that are being built, but they're usually being built in specific domains. Okay, and I would just also comment that a lot of the testing techniques that you talked about and that I've also encountered, uh, aren't maybe specific to scientific software, but do require some domain expertise to help develop and evaluate. Yeah, I mean, even in configurability, it seems like it's a simple problem, but the hardest part is modeling that configuration space, understanding the dependencies. So you saw the example that we gave of that assembly tool. Um, part of the challenge there, there were some hidden dependencies that we weren't aware of. And so, your model has to consider that. And often these are things are not documented and this happens across all software, not just scientific software. So sometimes just building the model to then test it is challenging. Thanks. So we had a, a quick question. Do you know any coverage tools for the R language? One of our attendees chimed in with cover and provided a link for that. I don't know if you're aware of anything else offhand. Um, I would I would have to look it up, but thank you for that link. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. I know there's lots of people working in Jupyter. There's a lot of people doing things like fuzzing, and I mean it's Python, but there you can use code coverage tools there. But I know people are developing special techniques for the notebooks as well. But thank mm -hmm. you for the one. Are there any particular resources to learn about system testing for scientific software? We're trying to build those up. I'm, I'm, I've put a series of slides on my uh, website. I think, I think that if you look at some of the, um, there are people in the community that are, um, that are specifically working on scientific software. I don't want to give you full links now, but I can list some. So I know that there have been some workshops on correctness in scientific software. Some of them funded by DOE and NSF, and I and try to put some links on, on our website to some of that research. Um, but there are several people working in this area uh, on very, again, it's domain specific. Um, and I know that there are people talking about the bigger problem of research software engineering and, and being able to um, make those correct. So. And hopefully we can get you to provide some pointers to some of those people yeah. and other resources yeah. in the Q&A. Well, I, I don't so. want to just, yeah, I don't want to just mention names now and sure. leave people out. So I'd like to be able to give you a little more comprehensive link. Yeah. Yeah. So people interested might want to come back and check on that uh, in the Q&A document. Mm -hmm. um, next up, what are some strategies for good input generation or selection for testing uh, through through software generation, e.g. random tests or perhaps manually designed cases? 
Yeah, so there are some very good, it depends on what your language is right now, but there are some good tools. For instance, there's a tool called EvoSuite that works on Java um, that will generate tests that actually cover um, that cover your, it covers as much code as it can and it uses many different coverage metrics. Um, there are random testing techniques. There are fuzzers. So a lot of the fuzzers, um, they tend to build much larger sets of tests where something like an Evo suite or random testing also tries to build smaller test suites with coverage to be able to give you an Oracle so that, or you can create your own Oracle. The challenge with something like a fuzzing is that it generates so many test cases, it's hard for you to come up with those manual Oracles. But there are some of these, so something like EvoSuite works using evolutionary algorithms. Some of the random tools now use like adaptive kind of feedback driven um, results. Again, many of those are written for tools more in the Java environment, but people have been building some for other languages as well. And those help you, you know, they generate tests based on coverage. All right. Let's go with one last question from the Q&A document. There's a few more that we won't get to, and we'll ask you to answer sure. those offline so people can uh, come back and, and check those out later. But the last one we'll have is, uh, thanks for your great talk. I have two questions. Uh, how can we conduct model slash specification driven testing when the model or specification of the target software system is not available? And um, let's do that one first. And then there's a second part, which is separate. Great question. So some of what, you know, so this is a challenge. Sometimes what people do is they use um, what we call invariance. So they'll try to reverse engineer the code to pull out invariance on both the code or on the model um, and use that. Um, often what we do is uh, we build test cases and our test cases sometimes become the model, which is not ideal. But over time, if we build up um, tests over the evolution of a system, um, but I think the real way to do it is through reverse engineering. So there are some techniques to try to reverse engineer code, reverse engineer behavior, um, and then add tests over time based on that, and that becomes your model. But but yeah, yeah it's talent. And again, domain knowledge. If you it's a if it's a hard scientific discipline, you need domain knowledge to do it. So. And then the real last question: Could you please comment on the major differences between testing scientific mm -hmm. software and regular software? Yeah. So great question. Um, I think there's a lot of commonality, but I think that in scientific software some of the challenges really relate to um, the input space. So the input space are often, they're often data driven. So we often have systems that are not just simple inputs, but they're data and data sets. Um, we're also modeling science. We're modeling often things that we don't understand. So we're often modeling natural phenomenon and we often have um, stochasticness in those. So I think while there's a lot of commonality, I think the difficulty is um, is greater in the scientific community. And we're also doing a lot of numerical computation. So, you know, a lot of traditional software isn't doing really high-end matrix algebra and things like that that we're doing in the scientific community and visualization. So I think that really makes it challenging. Great, thank you so much, Myra. Thanks to everybody for uh, joining us today and for your excellent questions. We will be, um, We'll have Myra complete the Q&A and answer the uh, questions we didn't get to as well. And we'll have that, the recording and the slides available. Uh, everybody who registered for the webinar will get an email when that's available. Please share with your colleagues who might be interested as well. Thank you all very much and a special thanks to Myra. And thank you for inviting me today. Thank you.